So Andy Phillips, if I can call you Andy, yes. is currently an assistant professor at the MGH Institute of Health Professions. He received his doctorate in nursing informatics at Columbia University School of Nursing, studying health information technology policy and technology transformations in complex adaptive systems. He earned a BS in economics from Washington University in St. Louis and a BS in nursing from Columbia University School of Nursing. Mr. Phillips worked as a pediatric ICU nurse and served as co-chair of that hospital's Nursing Quality Council. Prior to entering the field of nursing, Dr. Phillips spent over 20 years in the fields of actuarial science, software development, and quality improvement. And I've worked on many projects with Andy, and I can say he's just a joy to work with. He's just really an honor. And it's really an honor to have him here because he is going to basically review the year in review of nursing informatics research in 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I said, we're an operational group, so it'll be, but it's always wonderful to really synthesize and reduce this. And FYI to the group, Andy's done it for the last couple of years, and Dr. Patricia Dykes kind of started off this section. And for those of you that are interested, it is out all those past five years are out on our YouTube channel. So if it's helpful to you for any of your academic work or just of interest, please feel free to drop in and check it out. Andy. All right, here we go. You ready? <clears throat> All right, first I have to say, I say this every single time, don't miss a meeting. I missed 2015. I've been doing this now for three years. <laughs> All right, so I have my disclaimers, but it doesn't seem like anyone else did, so maybe these are a given. I have no apparent conflicts. This is for CE stuff, right? Um, I'm going to evaluate learning objectives and evaluate the themes that impact nursing informatics over the last year, identify any gaps that I see. Again, these are my opinions on what's going on, so I'm going to say some stuff that you're going to go, I don't agree with him at all. Um, but again, it's my opinion, so I get to say them, and you get to sit and listen. Uh, and then look at next steps or other things that I think need to be done as far as nursing research. And we've heard some of that already today, and you'll see that the literature is supporting some of what you've heard already, which I went, Phew, that's a good thing. <clears throat> All right. The methods um, that I've applied is a scoping study methodology to get a, a, broad, uh, uh, a broad set of literature that I can then kind of whittle down into something that's, quote, manageable. Uh, so it's, you know, I'm going to identify the research, I look at relevant studies, pick some studies to look at. And then I make pretty graphs and stuff, which I got to come up with something better than that. Uh, colorize, summarize, and kind of say my piece about what's going on there. Again, I'm talking fast because I got my 30 minutes. <clears throat> All right. So research question. What are the trends, themes that emerged from the survey of published literature over the last year? What is the meaning, current context? Again, speaking fast, short thing. What got published doesn't mean anything. Um, <laughs> Search strategy, nice and big, right? Nursing, nursing informatics, or nursing informatics over a year. Gets you quite a big, big list of uh, publications. Uh, I'm including anything that's research, contributing to nursing informatics, um, prototype development, testing, clinical care deliveries. I'm excluding articles that are focused on informatics education, nursing education, nursing students, and that's doesn't say it there, but that's not research. Um, so there's a lot of opinion pieces that end up coming back with this kind of a search. I'm excluding those kinds of things, unless they're, they're actually research. Uh, so this is what I had. I came up with six, 790 articles. And fortunately, there are 24 that were duplicates. <laughs> I did not have to look at those 24. Uh, so 766 I actually did look at. I just looked at the abstracts. I just looked at the abstracts. Um, I was able to get rid of 535 of them. 253 I actually read <clears throat> very quickly. <laughs> um, I was very quickly able to turn out 64 of those. I had to read more. I didn't have to read as thoroughly. Uh, I ended up evaluating 189 articles. All right. Okay, so this is the trend over time. You'll notice that Patty, if she's here, 30, 48, 30, right? <clears throat> um, my fault, though. <laughs> my fault, though, I changed the, the methodology, all right? Because I thought it'd be nice to have a nice broad scope and see what we came up with. So there's the line, too bad, Andy, right? <laughs> 
So, all right. What's that? <laughs> next year, you're going to go back to a different method, right? Yeah. Uh, a through C, and then next year, I'll do C through whatever. Yeah. So, research setting, there's no, no, nothing surprise here. And I think one of the themes that comes out of this is that there's not a lot of surprises. Um, we're still looking at the same things, and, and the stuff I'll talk about in more detail is we're just doing it differently. We have new tools that are out there, so we're still talking about clinical decision support. We're still talking about documentation. We're still talking about all these things, but we're able to talk about them much differently than we were before. We have all these tools. We have all this data now. There's a lot more ways that we can look at the same things and looking at them in a new way. So this is really no surprise. You know, most of the stuff is done in hospitals. That's the red thing. Um, I was at a presentation a week ago, and they said, never, ever, ever use pie charts. So next year, <laughs> there will be no pie charts. <clears throat> um, so, so between hospitals and continuum of care, that's the bulk of it. And one of the things I noticed is, as I was reading all these is that we're kind of getting in this area where kind of ambulatory and continuum care are kind of becoming the same thing, right? We're trying to keep people out of the hospital. So that whole process of ambulatory care, the continuum of care from the hospital to other settings, it's kind of becoming the same thing. So I've merged them as far as this is concerned um, uh, in some later slides. And it, it's a big chunk. It's almost becoming more than the, just the hospital piece as far as the setting of, of the studies. And I think that's one of the findings that I've found is a trend, which is we're seeing more and more of this, the settings becoming these kind of continuum of care ambulatory settings because that's where a lot of the care is taking place. That's where we need to come up with those new innovations on how to do those things cost effectively uh, and, in a, and in a high quality way with good outcomes. Um, same thing with other kind of charts. I think I was told not to do this either. <coughs> Uh, but again, that ambulatory continuum of care concept, they're kind of merging. As I read these more and more and more, that's a trend. Those are coming together. Uh, by country, U.S. seems to be the setting for most of these, uh, although there's some that, that I see more. And then they're not big, but I'm seeing more in the Middle East. I'm seeing more in China. Uh, and that should be expected, I think. These are large. Um, China, at least, is a large country. It's trying to... Uh, do a lot as far as technology, uh, and you know they need they're going to try to publish and, and start doing a lot more of that. So, uh, and then the Middle East, I, I saw a bunch of articles there, so I thought I'd just point that out as well. Um, so there were significant numbers there, more than what I've seen in the past. Finland, Norway, Sweden. There's some other places that we usually see some publications from, and these were equal to it. So I thought I'd just highlight those, um, and now I've really highlighted them. <coughs> uh, uh, okay, and then by topic, again, it's, it's uh, I just do by topic? No. Uh, it's, again, it's, it's the same thing. We've, we've talked about the important things here are, I think the pie actually works better. Um, telehealth and mobile, right? That's still a big thing, telehealth and mobile. And then the other side is that documentation and clinical decision support. So again, clinical decision support, documentation, extremely important. How do we do it? We can do it better now. We have new tools. We have new ways of looking at it. We have data mining. We have data science. We have uh, all the electronic health records. We have uh, all the data that goes into those. We have dashboards. We have all these things we can do now uh, that we couldn't do probably just two, three years ago. Uh, and we're seeing that uh, in the literature. As far as telehealth and mobile, uh, I'll talk about an article if I have time. And <clears throat> we're seeing that continue to grow. We want to figure out how to get more of this pushed out to the patient. How much can the patient do as far as collecting information on their health and pushing it back to the primary care? Patient is very much the center of a lot of the research now. Uh, is it all focused on telehealth mobile? No. But it's a big chunk. You know, the patient wearable devices. What do we do with all this data? Uh, and how do we make it effective for improving care? So one of the themes that's coming out of this is this, this segment of the pie that's been there for a while is becoming more and more, um, what's the word? Not important, but critical. Uh, it's, it's becoming more of a, of a tool that is becoming uh, important to kind of this whole outpatient care. How do we keep people out of the hospital? If we can monitor someone remotely, uh, and keep them out of the hospital that way, then that's very important. So most of the research here is more about that. How do we monitor people? How do we make these devices 
uh, effective. Uh, I think there was a presenter here two years ago who talked about how many mobile apps there are right now for healthcare, right? It, was, it wasn't two, <coughs> um, it's hundreds of thousands. So how do we use those? If people use them for a month and never use it again, that's not very helpful. So a lot of the studies are about how do we get people and how do we decide how to design these things so that they're actually usable. So we got all that usability stuff that went into the implementation of EHRs. We now got to talk about usability as far as um, individual devices. Uh, same thing, chart I shouldn't use again. <clears throat> okay, so now we get to the fun part. I was able to do all of that quickly. So this is good. So now I get to talk about some, some studies here. So clinical decision port, documentation, still the main focus, 25% of all the studies. We can use EHRs to generate data, predictive tools, disease progression, deterioration. Uh, we have AI. We have all sorts of things we can do as far as um, data mining and things like that. And one of the interesting <coughs> studies, which I had to read it five times, um, it's actually from Nature. Uh, which was interesting. I hadn't read an informatics article from Nature before, so I figured, well, I should show it. <coughs> so here it is. This is like the cool chart from Nature, right? So in and of itself, this is cool and should be talked about today. You know, it's look at it, right? This has got to be telling us something, right? It's not a pie chart. It's not a bar chart. You know, it's, it's something and it's, it's in Nature of all places, so this has got to be really important. So what they did was, is they talked about, they kind of led off the, the discussion talking about the Framingham study. Do people know what the Framingham study was, right? Uh, and they said, gee, the Framingham study took 17 years to link hypertension with stroke, right? 17 years. We can't, how can we do that going forward? We can't wait that long. We can't have these big longitudinal studies that take that long to figure out what those relationships are. Are there better ways of doing that now that we have different kinds of data? <clears throat> So what they did is they came up with a proof of concept of, okay, can we use EHR data with known biomarkers and try to come up with new connections between um, phenotypes that we know about that are identified easily in EHR and, you know, specific outcomes um, with, a, with, a, with a patient. And can we do that without doing these big longitudinal studies? And they were able to show that they could. So, I don't really know what this chart means, but it was just so cool. Um, but the basic thing is at the bottom are the, are the phenotypes, right? So you can, um, uh, the coagulation, all that kind of stuff, and the top are some of the um, uh, you know, biomarkers that go along with it. So they were able to show all these connections, uh, and they validated it. This is really just looking at hypertension, which you know a lot about. So they were using this as a validation of stuff we already know, and they were able to take these biomarkers combined with some EHR data and basically show the same thing. Uh, and that's because you have these huge databases now within electronic health records, and they were able to now show these, uh, show these relationships. Pretty damn cool. I want to know the software they used to create that, though. <laughs> Uh, so another thing is, is going to the telehealth issue. So one of the issues you have with telehealth is how do we make it effective, right? So we have all these devices that people wear their Fitbits, their, they have their phones, they have all these things. But one of the problems we're having is that people aren't using them long term. We have lots of studies, and I've read a whole bunch of them this year and last year where you were able to show that you know, people who are monitored you know, outpatient and they report their blood glucose and you know, after six months they have a better outcome than someone who wasn't using it. Well, two years later, are they still using that device? And that's really the question, right? For this to be effective, it really has to be something that's sustainable. And so there's research that was starting to trickle in here about how do we make these devices and these tools this kind of patient reported data sustainable. So if we can't make it sustainable, then it's really not helpful to us. Uh, we can show over six months that it's fine. We can even show over a year it's time. But how do we make these things sustainable so that people use them and we actually get the full benefit from it? Uh, so there were two studies that I picked out. Uh, and one looked at, um, let's get to here. It was a qualitative, uh, 
it was a, basically it was a literature search of patient-generated health data. And what are the various ways that you do that and what are the potential barriers and obstacles to that? So one of the big barriers, a couple barriers, one barrier was the knowledge gap. So you're asking someone to do something with a mobile device, the patient goes, why? <clears throat> and there's that knowledge gap about what the data can do for them from a health perspective and what the patient understands that health issue is. So if the patient doesn't understand why it's important to monitor, I don't know why I keep picking on this, uh, monitor, let's pick on something, monitor your exercise and how that relates to um, frailty, <clears throat> then it's not really helpful because they're not going to use it. So there's that knowledge gap out there. So we got to figure out how to address that knowledge gap if we're going to make these devices usable, right? There's all these, what is it, the SUS or all those different usability tools that are out there that talk about, gee, there has to be that ease of use, there has to be that value to the person using it before they adopt it. No one's going to adopt an EHR system if they don't find that it's valuable to them and they don't find it easy to use. Same thing with these devices. They have to understand the value. And because of that knowledge gap, you have this value gap as well. Uh, so what this literature review showed was that exists. There is this knowledge gap between patient and provider, which is a barrier to accepting some of this technology. Uh, the other barrier was what I talked about, that sustainability. How do we get people to continue to use it? Those barriers are somewhat related, but you know, how do we get people to use these devices or provide data um, into an EHR system, use a patient portal? How do we be able to use that uh, if, if, they, if it's not sustainable? All right? So those were the two barriers. And, and, I, and I included um, articles from the same same author, because there was a follow-up study by the same set of authors that was a qualitative one where they went out and interviewed people and talked about what are the issues around patient-reported health data. Uh, and what they found out was, was that it's those same things. You know, so one, they did a literature review, and then they actually physically went out and did focus groups and talked to people, and it still came down to the same thing. There has to be that perceived value to using the device. This is no different than we went through EHR adoptions. How do we find that perceived value for these devices, right? My Apple Watch is really cool, but then it wasn't. <clears throat> all right, I can't touch it any, I mean, it, it does all sorts of stuff, and it can tell me how I walk, but at some point I don't really care how much I walked, uh, because I don't have no one to tell, <clears throat> and I don't know what the value is anymore, other than, gee, I now know how many steps I took during the day, but I'm taking a device, I feel like I'm pretty healthy, and yet, you know, I've already lost interest in, you know, some of the data that's there, uh, and there's really nowhere to report it, um, and those kinds of things. So in a qualitative and both a kind of a literature review, these same issues are coming up. And we have to figure this one of the things, we're talking about trends, gaps, that's where some research is required too. We need to figure out how to make these patient-reported mechanisms more desirable and easier to use and of value um, to, uh, to the patient. Um, going forward. All right. Uh, another study I thought was really neat. Obviously, they're all really cool because I picked them out. You didn't. <laughs> uh, so uh, this one talks about, obviously, we want to keep people out of This is where that mushing of ambulatory and continuum of care comes into place. So this study looked at a, uh, a number of ambulatory care centers. Uh, and uh, the kind of the the difference was in one ambulatory care center, they did an intervention where they had direct contact with their patients and went through an interview with them when they had left, um, asking various social determinants of health questions. You know, do they have a place to live? You know, could they eat? You know, how are they feeling? You know, what's their family structure? All these kinds of questions. Uh, and then the other ambulatory center did not. Uh, and one thing just to note is that there's been a lot of research, and I see it with the last three years I've done that, is that most of these things, when you provide personal, one-on-one, -on -one, a person talking to you, you always have better outcomes. That They work much better than the devices. They do all sorts of things. So that one-on-one -on -one thing really hasn't changed. Our, our desire as individuals to talk directly to a provider has not changed. Um, and I don't know how necessarily you're going to change that. But that's, that's something fundamentally going forward, we're going to have to figure out how to do. 
People don't want to talk to a watch. People don't want to talk to something else. If you can get that one-on-one, -on -one, that's great. But we also need to be affordable, reduce costs, things like that. So what this, this article found, the results were, was that if they did that, even the expense of having um, a nurse talk to patients individually on a regular basis, they were able to show that the ambulatory practice saved money. Five minutes? OK. Um, <laughs> So, so, really, five? All right. OK. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I said I would do it. Yeah, OK. So, so what they were able to show is that they saved $644 per patient in the, uh, in, the, in the group with the intervention versus the group without the intervention. Uh, and they generated $71,000 more in revenue because the patients went to them instead of the ER. <clears throat> so they were able to save money and create revenue that more than paid for that cost of the nurse providing that benefit. So that's a neat model, right? Okay, if you can replicate that and avoid ED visits and avoid hospital stays, that's a great model. So this just one, you know, limitation here is just one ambulatory care practice. I mean, it was a very small study, but they were able to show a financial model that would allow you to keep people out of the hospital and, and do it in a way that was financially sustainable. And even better for me as kind of some of my policy background, the core of it being we need to understand the other parts of the patient, the social determinants of health piece of that patient, not just the diagnosis, but what are those other things that are going on with that patient. Um, like for me, I have an 18-month-old who kept me up all night, although last night I got a great night of sleep. It was really nice. Um, but apparently I now owe my wife a two-day weekend. So, uh, oh well. Um, so anyway, uh, I always had something fun at the end, which everyone who has been here before knows. So robotics and nursing. <clears throat> so oddly, I kept running across articles that talked about robotics and nursing. I was going, hmm. Last three, I've never heard about robotics and nursing. So I thought I'd just give you some quotes from some of these articles. There are three, not a whole lot, uh, but there were three on other topics too. So robotics and nursing. The future outlook of nursing robots is promising. Right? How many of you agree with that? <laughs> right? <laughs> Turns out there's something called a negative attitudes toward robot scale. I can't not laugh at that. Right? <laughs> Sorry. All right, and uh, this is <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and it asks seriously. It asks questions like having your children cared for by a robot, <laughs> right? So I don't know how that gets validated, but <laughs> so anyway, they asked, asked that, and one of the things they found was that all ages had similar attitudes toward robots. So interesting, right? Old people, young people, middle-aged people really kind of had the same attitude for, for no bots, and their conclusion was that the implication for nursing, is all these are specific to nursing, uh, nurses who design, develop, and use robotic interventions, there's significant implications of this. Okay. <laughs> no real idea of what, seriously, no real idea what those implications are, but they said there's implications, and I think the implications have to do with, we're really all not afraid of robots, or not that, might say it differently. We all have the same attitude, you know, whatever that attitude is. But there is a negative attitude toward robot scale. It's incredible. Uh, and then, the, I, oh, someone's coming up. Uh, and then the uh, <laughs> last one was, uh, was the last robot one was, was challenges, um, challenges traditional thinking. I spelled it wrong. Um, thinking's not a word, but thinking. Uh, challenges traditional thinking around technology as a dehumanizing force and presents a useful perspective where nurses can with something that I mistyped again um, contribute to this process. So their conclusion was we need to be challenging the thinking of nurses because robots are coming and we better be prepared, right? So, so anyway, robots are coming in nursing. We'll see how many we have next year on that one. All right. All right, that's it. Any thoughts, questions?